So hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our final series of Ask an Advocate and uh, for this year. So my name is Eliza Farrow. I'm the DEI Student Services Coordinator for the Women's Center. And today we have with us some folks from Oneida Nation. And our, um, our moderator today is going to be Shichua Zhang. So I'm going to hand it over to Shichua to get started. Thank you. Like I said, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. And thank you for rounding out our Ask an Advocate year, especially on Denim Day as well. Hope you're wearing your denim. Um, but we could just, oh yeah. Yes, I am. Awesome. Okay, so um, we can start with introductions. So your name, pronouns, and how long you have been with the agency. Uh, I, my name's Veronica Guzman. I am currently working at Oneida Nation Family Services under Jonah Halio Community Advocacy. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and um, I'm reading the question. It says background and education. Okay. Um, and I have a bachelor's in sociology with concentration in criminology and a bachelor's in justice studies. Thank you. That is really interesting. It's a little bit different than the other Ask and Advocates we've had, but that's really cool. Right. So um, our second question would be, what does a victim slash survivor advocate do? And what are some examples of your job duties? So we, um, working for a tribe is very unique agency, um, but we we model a lot of the state and county uh, responsibilities. So we support the survivor through physical, emotional, and legal healing, uh, support and collaborate with other agencies um, because Oneida, we don't have our own shelter yet. It's, you know, it's been talked about in, for years, but it's not um, in the works yet. Um, so we have to constantly collaborate with other agencies in regards to shelter and certain services that um, our members don't qualify or our community because they're outside the reservation. So then we are heavily relying on that collaboration with other advocates and other agencies and counties. Um, so we also uh, problem solve and support clients uh, with financial and emotional and legal support. Um, we guide them through, um, you know, a very vulnerable time for them um, to become independent and self-sufficient. And um, one of the unique um, attributes that Oneida has, we have a culturally component and cultural healing that we also um, add to our, our groups, educational groups and um, because my position was vacant for so long, um, we are starting to add uh, healing groups through um, culturally beating um, in many crafts that I, I think I will answer that later. <laughs> so it sounds like you do a lot um, and it sounds like you have um, more recently gone into this role. So thank you for doing that. And thank you for, um, thank you just for trying to continue and expand your services. I think that's beautiful. Thank you. Our next question is what does advocacy look like for you and how do you incorporate it into your role? So as an advocate, I want to, um, meet my clients at their level of need and support wanted um, because sometimes um, our clients, we know they need more support and they're not willing or open to take it. So I feel as an advocate, it's very important to, to read and um, not physically, but emotionally and body space, uh, how much of advocacy they want and they need. Um, I have clients that are heavily hold my hand, let walk me through everything, um, A through Z. I have other clients like, give me the application, I'll take care of it, just direct me the right direction. Um, so I feel as an advocate, we're in a position that um, we just kind of read our clients and build the report 
and meet them with where they're at at the time. Thank you. I think that's a really important piece to remember when you're talking about advocacy, um, that it looks different for every client, looks different for every person. And so um, anybody who is watching that is considering being in an advocate role, it is definitely going to be a role that changes and looks different every single day. So thank you for putting it that way. Our next question is, do you offer any culturally specific services? Um, if so, what are some examples of what you provide? Yes, that's the, I feel the unique of our department and our community as a whole. We do have um, a unique, you know, uh, culturally approach. So we do have a cultural wellness department and that was established maybe five years ago, if I remember correctly. They do holistic healing and anthropology healing. I That's very new to me. Um, I did do a session just to understand, and it's um, more um, in shapes and abstracts uh, healing. It's very unique to every individual. Um, definitely um, some a unique experience. And um, so wellness department is very culturally heavy healing. And most of our therapists are licensed. However, they don't have that red tape that our Oneida Behavioral Health has. So they can do Reiki, they can do um, smudging. Um, so those are just culturally, you know, traditional healings that, um, and I have a little bit of show and tell towards the end. So you guys understand like some of the items that we utilize here. Um, we also in our, <clears throat> And like I mentioned before, in our, um, in my own programming, I, I started adding um, culturally healing and um, beating. That's very therapeutic for a lot of our clients. Um, we started doing uh, ribbon skirt making, basket weaving. Um, we are having next month a, an empowering painting by a Native artist. Um, to honor the MMIW organization that we collaborate with. And um, we also start incorporating uh, native foods in our groups, um, like corn soup um, by native um, company that it's locally in Oneida. Um, and um, this summer we're hoping to do a garden with our women's group. So culturally, food and healing go hand in hand, and it's very important for the Oneida culture. Those are all really creative ways of healing, and I think they're so beautiful. I think it's something that we should implement everywhere, but I understand how important it is culturally. Um, I really loved that you mentioned that um, you also had to go through um, that like type of healing so that you understood what services you were providing. I think that's a really important piece about being an advocate. And also what you said about all that red tape. Um, I totally agree. I think um, just kind of having people who have shared lived experiences is really important so you can move past that. Uh, I just wanted to ask though, um, what does MMIW stand for? Oh, the Missing and Murderous uh, Indigenous Woman. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, our next question is, how do you commit to equity within your agency? So I struggled a little bit with this question, but um, then I just started, you know, um, processing some of my experiences working in this program um, with the Native population. So our program, it is very specific for Native um, and um, the Every program in Oneida is different. Their qualifications are different. So I just want to put that out there for information. But this program in particular, you only have to identify as native. So you can be a descendant from a different tribe. Um, you can, you don't even, as long as you identify as native, you qualify for our program and our services. Um, some of our programming, if you live in um, Adiami and Brown County, you are welcome to come and see. Um, some of our programming that it's open to the public. I feel like it's important if you live around our reservation that you should be aware of our customs and traditions. And um, it's 
very welcoming to te their teachings. They're always very open to learn our traditions and um, and take something positive out of it and understanding each other. So um, just processing the, the question, um, I feel like, you know, it like in every organization, you know, somebody that's an Oneida Enroll member might feel, you know, maybe a little more entitled or not. I don't, I haven't seen it personally in my, in my practice. I, if you're an Oneida Enroll member, or if you're a descendant, or if you're a Potawatomi, any other tribe, you are treated with the same respect and welcoming to um, our services and cultural and tradition. Um, the only thing that did trigger a thought is that the misinformation in our local agencies around us is that, for example, if I have a client, they automatically think that um, they don't need to be part of their services because they're involved with a tribal advocate. Um, and that's not always the, the right approach. It's, um, you know, I have to constantly educate agencies that Native um, Oneida members are dual citizen. They are tribal members. However, they are entitled to county services. Um, and just explaining that with um, agencies to give them knowledge. Like, you know, I had a client because Oneida is such a small community, um, they didn't want to do services at Oneida Behavioral Health. They wanted to do the county treatment um, or services. Well, they were rejecting her base that she had eligibility on that other service. I said, yes, but she is a resident of your county. So you, she needs and wants to be serviced there. I can't force her to come here. So it was a struggle a little bit. I feel sometimes we are overworked, short staff. And if we can, you know, kind of sway away a client. Um, so that's the advocacy I have to do in addition to my job is educating um, other agencies and other professionals like, yes, they're Oneida and yes, they have the option to come here, but it's it's their option to go to county services if they please to. Um, so I come across it probably three in the last six months, three times, three different situations. So um, my goal being so new in this position, I've been here seven months. I've been with the tribe eight years. Um, it's continuously educating what, you know, what entitles to be a tribal member and what services we don't have, like shelter. We don't have crisis either. So we heavily rely on that collaboration with counties. Like, hey, if you are working with the native, um, please send the referral. And if they qualify, we are more than glad to collaborate or, you know, alleviate a little bit of your, of your caseload. Um, so I am continuously working on that. So. Yeah. Well, thank you for showing us a little bit about how equity looks different in every agency, especially like multicultural agencies, and how you have to approach things a little bit differently. It is really hard to hear that a lot of the times um, people who need your services get turned away by other people and having to have that line of communication with other agencies can get really difficult, but thank you for continuing to do that work. So um, our question number six is, what are some of the joys you have experienced working in your role? I know you said you've only been there seven months, but I'm sure there's a lot of joys. Yes, absolutely. So <clears throat> I feel that some of the positives in our role, obviously, is heavy secondary trauma with the crisis that we have to go through, um, but is seeing that person in the beginning stages or in the, you know, taking steps towards their healing and closing that door. Um, because I feel that a lot of my, I, some of my clients, they get stuck in that trauma and relive it because all they want to do is talk about it and talk about it. And, you know, everybody's healing looks differently. So holding that space and letting them, you know, heal on their own way, but sometimes is, you know, out of your scope and as you're like, okay, maybe we need to add therapy because this is, you need to step forward. So the best part of the job is when you actually see that I don't want to say stubborn, but that, you know, like hold 
or are haltered um, trauma that you finally see them taking those steps into healing and um, and flourishing and taking advantage of all the services that we have to offer. Um, that is um, one of the best joys that I do have. And it gives you that little spark to keep doing it because we do see a lot of, um, you know, cycling into the system over and over and you're like when and then you get that one client that actually succeed and that's what gives you that energy and that positive and fills your cup and you're like okay I'm making a difference one client at a time or you know so that that is um one of my joys um but as a my position as a whole is um doing community outreach and doing events. So I've been very fortunate that I came into this position and, you know, it, they were supposed to hire somebody in 2020, but because of COVID restrictions, um, the tribe couldn't hire anybody. So we had a lot of funding just sitting there. So when, when, I, when I started, they're like, here's all this money that needs to be spent. So um, that was fun because I was able to you know, as Sexual Assault Awareness Month, we I was able to put two, three, four big events uh, for the community education um, the first week of April. Um, then we had um, a self-defense training. Uh, it was like a two and a half hour for some of the women that came in and um, took a self-defense class. And it was very fun. And then we are having... Um, a native author, well, they're twins. So they're two native authors are presenting tonight. So I was a little scattered earlier because I was like, oh my God, I have so much going on. And, but I really wanted to participate and put our program out there. Um, so, you know, other advocates or other community members know what services we're providing. Um, so those are some of the positive things that teaching, educating and preventing some of the abuse and um, or even being aware of those red flags um, gives me very um, a lot of joy and passion to continue doing this work. I'm really happy to hear that. Um, I think anybody listening who is interested in going into this line of work, it can be really hard to continue to find your spark. And so I'm really happy that you've been able to find that and hearing that you are facilitating four large events in one month is a lot and that there are some tonight. I wish you all the best. Thank you for being here even more now. Mm -hmm. um, I hope all of them are wonderful. And is there like a place that we can see all of the events you're putting on? Do you have social media that people can follow? We do. We do have a Facebook page that's, um, and I can email them. Maybe you could pass. Um, so it's family service, Oneida Family Services. And then it's all our departments. And then under events, it has all the updates of uh, events going on within the community. Um, and then it'll say there, if it's open to the community, that means, you know, you don't have to be an Oneida member. You don't have to be an employee. You don't, you can participate. And I encourage people to come. Like I, I'm always advocating, you know, come and learn a little bit of what we have. You know, we do have, we're fortunate that other advocates are now that we are in person. I feel like Oneida was like holding that till the last minute. Um, we are able to invite other advocates to see, you know, our services, our programming, and doing a lot of collaboration. Yeah, I think you mentioned this before, but like building community, right? That's all. Mm -hmm. That's all what this is about, and that's really important to share it with other agencies to show. Um, that you have these services available and also just, just have a good time. And so like that self-defense class sounds so amazing and so fun. So I'm really happy that that was something you were able to put on. Yeah. Um, and there's some pictures on our website, on the fam on the Facebook. And, you know, we are hoping to do that training or that those, their educational outreach for the community a couple of times a year, because self-defense, it's always something, especially in, I feel like lately we, as women, we just have to be aware of our surroundings. And it's nice that you learn a technique that's muscle memory and um, and just be aware. So yeah, absolutely. It was definitely a lot of fun. That's awesome. So I'm gonna 
switch a little gears from like a little happier to a little harder, but what are some of the challenges you have experienced working in your role? Um, so like I mentioned before is um, we don't have a shelter. So we um, heavily have to rely on collaboration with the counties. Um, you know, Oneida Reservation is in Brown and Adigami County. So we have to, we have double the work, you know, collaborating with Adigami County and then Brown County. And sometimes some of our members are outside. They're in, in Menominee tribe. They're in, living in Potawatomi. So we have to constantly collaborate. It's a lot of education because every tribe functions their sovereignty in a different, you know, so not two tribes are the same. So we have to learn, learn their culture, learn their skills, learn whatever intake process, what, what is, because Menominee, I believe they do have the, they have their um, shelter. I believe they opened it about a year ago. Um, so we have been collaborating with them to have, you know, um, if our client wants to stay there and how to do that process. Um, and, you know, obviously with our local agencies, Harbor House, Golden House, um, Reach, we, we've been putting ourselves out there. And um, one thing that I didn't mention um, is we did change our name. Our name was before Oneida. Ooh, Oneida Domestic and Prevention Program. Um, and we just changed our name, I believe the end of last year, but it officially became this year with our grants and our um, logos and printing and everything. So we are officially Jonah Halio Community Advocacy. Um, and um, let's see, um, another big um, challenge is um, other than sheltering is uh, renting. So we had funding last, our last grant last year um, for a transitional living, meaning that we, it's kind of like the voucher program. You get a voucher for 12 months, uh, as long as you find a home and, and or an apartment to rent. Um, but that program was left with so much funding. So we have to, um, writing the grant again for, this fiscal year, we had to take that program out because it wasn't working for, for the community. We couldn't find apartments that were taking um, the voucher or were taking um, our client space. You know, they don't have enough credit, their employment, they just been hired, not enough history. Um, daycare was a big one too this year. I feel like it was always a struggle, but since COVID, I feel like it's been a little more challenging. Um, so yeah, I feel like those are some of the struggles that, and challenges that we have um, as a community right now. Thank you for sharing. I, I really do believe that these issues are um, kind of heightened because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm really happy to see that you are all continuing the work, even though things are pretty difficult over there. Um, everywhere, but um, we do have a question in the chat. Um, so what is the meaning behind the new name, Jonah Halil? Um, So one of the um, kind of founders of the program or the heart of the program, um, that was her Oneida name. So we had to change it a little bit. It means a great fine. Um, and in to honor her, um, we decided to Oh, I'm sorry, she passed away um, in 2020 or 2021. Um, it was right before my time. I did meet her because I was still in family services. So um, she passed away the, the, and then our program wanted to honor her. So they adapted that name, meaning a grapevine. I think that's really, really impactful. But thank you so much for sharing that with us. So what activities do you utilize for self-care to prevent vicarious trauma? Okay, so Oneida has excellent support for wellness programs. So I'm gonna give you a brief list and then I'll tell you what I do personally to take advantage. So we have, um, so we're in the kind of Galil building, which I wrote it somewhere what it means and I, lost it because everything fell but um 
it's the so old social services building. We, a lot of us just address it as social services building, but I wanted to give the official name. It might be here, uh, but it doesn't say what it means. Um, it's an Oneida word and we have the gym attached to us. So not only do we get a free gym, we also get free um, 30 minutes of paid time to work out to make sure that we are taking that physical wellness activity. Um, we also have um, a free chiropractor. He was in the building, but since COVID, they moved him by the Radisson. So we make an appointment, we get a, get adjusted, and they don't even run our insurance. Oneida pays him directly. So it's one of the perks that we have. We have a nurse in the building. If we're not feeling well, if we need a strep test or an ear infection, we do go to the third floor. <clears throat> she can write prescriptions for us. So um, little conveniences that we have. We have an adventure program, uh, which normally on the lunchtime, they'll send out a flyer in our communications and um, they do hiking around the Oneida Reservation. They do kayaking in the summer. We also have a rock climbing, um, uh, what do you call it? A rock climbing and adventure, whatever, like, um, you know what I mean? <laughs> adventure is like, um, what is it? Um, zip lining. Oh my God, I'm blanking. So they have, we have that um, to take during our lunch. Um, what else do we have? Um, we have the uh, access to the wellness department. Like I said, we can do um, a session. They come and do smudging every month, you know, to take all those negative energies and lift us a little bit. Um, and we also get reflective practice therapy uh, once a month if you sign up. And these are programs, obviously, offered by Oneida, no cost to you, um, just to really focus on your wellness and make sure that you are uh, taking care of yourself. Um, we also, let's see. Um, have they provide essential oils for us? They provide sage um, for, in our office. Like I had it burning. Oh, it just turned off. I had it burning, and it was just like smoky. I was like, "Oh my god, this is excessive!" But um, just little um, acknowledgments to our employee, you know, to everyone to say, "Hey, we we see you, we hear you. Your work is hard. Take care of yourself." Um, so personally, I do take advantage of the gym. I try to go every time I have the time. Um, we do get a half an hour of paid time to lunch and a half an hour of physical activity. So you technically can get an hour paid time to go work out. And um, so I do do that. I do try to practice. This year was my goal to do more meditation and positive affirmations. Um, I believe the energy that you put out there is what you receive. And um, I do love that since I transitioned to being an advocate, I could check out at 4.30 and I can focus on my family time at the end of the day because that's what fills my cup um, and recharges me so I can start the next day and do that all over again. Well, all of the things that you do for self-care as um, personal and as like an agency sound amazing. I think uh, reconnecting with nature and just being outside is one of the best ways to recharge personally for me. So it's beautiful that you have the time to do that and get paid for 30 minutes of it, which is really nice. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Something about the zip lining, like that just is so awesome. And the chiropractor, like I know <laughs> that I know other people in here probably like like the back cracking videos on TikTok and stuff. That is awesome <laughs> that yeah. you just get that. Um, but yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think it's really beautiful. And just talking about family and how that recharges you, really important to remember that that is one of the biggest support systems that we could have. Yeah. Yeah, we used to have a, a massage therapist, but COVID <laughs> took her away mm. um, and breaking. But that we still have... a access to it but it's not as simple as it used to be but I hope they bring it back I hope so too that sounds amazing <laughs> um and we are on to our last question um so 
how can individuals not in a formal advocate role support victims slash survivors of sexual assault? Um, so to be supportive, um, listen without judgment, uh, meet them at their pace and encourage them to talk to or connect them to an advocate. Um, our program also um, connects with um, the support family members or friends um, to kind of guide them um, how to support them. Because sometimes when they something happens so traumatic, they just want to don't talk about it, get over it. It's going to go away on their own. Um, and we can provide some of those tools, uh, how to support them. And when they're ready, they will take you know, the next step. And we don't know when that will be, if it ever, ever they'll have the courage or, you know, the empowerment to confront their situation. So my best advice would be empathetic and, and supportive. Thank you. I think that's beautiful. I think um, we don't talk about the level of like patience and, and genuine care that it takes to really be an advocate. I think when we think about being an advocate, we think about um, all of the, the bigger things, but the, the smaller things are just genuinely caring and coming with the sense of gentleness. I think it's really, really important. We also have a question in the chat. So uh, Maddie said, what advice would you give to students who want to pursue this work? Oh, good question. I would recommend to volunteer and see if this is the work that you really want to do. It took me many, many, many years to figure out this is what I was, I wanted to do in my next chapter. Um, I feel like in heart, um, we're all advocates in one aspect or another. Um, but I feel that you can advocate in so many different departments. It just knowing where where's your nook that it, it gives you the passion to do it. It's hard work, and um, we have some excellent positive days, and then some not so positive days that nobody really talks about. You know, and and you kind of you can't talk about it. You know, you kind of have to heal within your own and find those outsources. And always, always, I learned the hard way check out at the end of the day, disconnect from your cell phone, your computer, fill your cup. Um, I was those people that never disconnected, burned out, and I needed to realize and find out that you need to disconnect because the work is going to be there the next morning. Your family, your child is growing up and you're missing a lot. So um, my best advice, I always have protective boundaries to protect yourself. It doesn't mean that you're not a good advocate. It does not mean that you don't care enough. It means that I have to take care of myself to be able to continue taking care of you, my family. And, you know, we have a lot, a lot of people that we take care of around ourselves. And um, if you don't allow yourself to recharge, um, it's going to catch up to you and you're, you're going to resent yourself. So I'm in a really good place. I clock out at 4.30. I don't clock in till eight. And um, I come in feeling positive and re-energized. And even though I know today it's a day that I, I started from eight to eight today, um, I was able to disconnect on time yesterday and said, you know what, tomorrow's gonna be a long day, but I'll be ready for it. And I won't think about it. And went rollerblading with my daughter, so. It's the little things that um, will definitely make this career a longer term and enjoy it as you're doing it. I hope that answered your question. I think it answered it perfectly. Um, yeah, those are all really great things to remember. Um, I think a huge thing is just realizing that in this role, you need that time for yourself and it's not selfish. You know, I think that's something that I personally like struggle with. So if anybody else listening is also struggling with understanding that we're not always supposed to be on all the time, I think that was a really beautiful way to put it. Um, you mentioned volunteering as like a piece of advice. So are there any volunteering options that you have? Um, I, in our agency, we don't, take volunteers or interns yet. We are just recently fully staffed. 
which I did want to mention a little bit about the all the advocates that we have to offer to the programming, and we can get that towards the end. Um, but I do know um, I worked with um, Amanda's House. I know that they do take volunteers and they help women transition. You know, it, it transition from trauma, from addiction, from um, you know, a lot of those women are going through child protection and just supporting them through that. Those hard vulnerable times you know our children are sacred and um to not be able to have them in your care so it's a it's a hard position and um Paula which is um and, and she has a beautiful story if you have time I think it's um Mandalin Foundation and I collaborated with her for a little bit and um she has a lot of passion in what she's doing um, she has a Facebook page and it's just the story. It's, it's beautiful. And I don't want to <clears throat> give anything out, but it's, it's worth the read. And, um, she's just amazing and generally doing it, uh, out of kindness of her heart. Like she is supporting and helping this woman. So, um, that's an organization that I would highly recommend. They do need the help and, um, it'll be a good, a good start to see what you're getting into. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I know that you were here as our Ask an Advocate, but I love that you showed us other organizations that you work with and continue to advocate for them. I think that just shows how much this all means in terms of community. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you. Um, is there anything else that you would like to share with us today? Yes, I would like to kind of go through because I was, as I'm doing our you know, trying to answer some of the questions, um, I thought, oh, I need to introduce my team. And um, our Jenna Jalio Community Advocacy has been uh, fully staffed, and I hope in a long time, uh, we just hired our last advocate. So we have two uh, women's de domestic violence advocate, and they focus on we just finished a book club. So we had a native author, and I was going to bring the book, and I didn't, but it's in her moccasin sense. It's an excellent read. We're able to have the author virtually. She answered questions. Um, very empowered. Um, they're starting an educational group in May, and they're uh, partnering with adventures, doing kayaking, hiking, um, being in nature. Um, and then we have a legal advocate. Um, she does most of our tribal court um, family court um, representation. She went through, I forgot what her program, but it's because um, in tribal courts, you don't have to have a license as an attorney. Um, as long as you take the tribal trial court, it's in Madison. It's a six month law school um, course. Sounds awesome and awful at the same time. Um, and so she represents, and then um, the DV advocates also do a companionship at um, counties, um, uh, courts, and any appearances that they have to go through. Um, and then it's me, I'm the sexual assault advocate. Um, and then we have a prevention kind of division under our department. And we have two community advocates there in the schools. Um, teaching um, no touch, good touch for at elementary. And then we have um, advocate in high schools um, and middle schools. And we have a female youth advocate and she does pretty much um, teenage groups, uh, teaching them healthy relationships, um, boundaries. Um, and we just got certified, gosh, what was it? Um, because I did it, she wanted a co-facilitator cool is My Life, My Choice, I believe. Not sure if you're familiar with that, but it's for human trafficking awareness. Um, and then we have a male youth LGBTQ2S advocate. Um, and he does um, also go in the schools. He has a spirit group and um, he does lacrosse with some of the the teenagers so he tries to do physical culturally you know the process very uh um traditional and in the tribes 
Um, so he tries to bring that in. And our most recent advocate is the Healthy Relationship Community Advocate. So she will be working with the abuser um, and they have like a court approved curriculum that they're, she's getting trained in. She believes she'll start taking referrals in August. Um, so it's, um, it's the last piece that we're missing to make our program complete. And um, again, if you have a, somebody that you feel that would be a good fit to our program, our information is on, on the Oneida page um, and um, our phone numbers, or I can send out my information and I can, you know, you can I always reach out. I'm always willing to work with other collabor collaborations and support, you know, the community. Thank you. That sounds like a stacked agency. <laughs> it sounds amazing. I think that it's really important to have um, very specific services. And so I'm really glad that you have advocates to fill all of these different roles and, and find, you know, like the cracks in the agency where you need more support and things like that. So I really appreciate the work that you guys do. Um, we do have a question in the chat from Kim. Um, so how does historical trauma, um, i.e. boarding schools, relocations, et cetera, intersect with your work and the interventions you provide? Um, does this show up a lot in your experience working with clients? It does. Unfortunately, it does. We do have a lot of clients that have open child protection cases and that historical trauma of snatching the Indian child is it's really present in our services um, in our community um, they you know um, but with healing and teachings and you know collaboration and um, and also understanding from other departments and learning that there the historical trauma is real it did happen and people are still dealing with it um, so we do have you know the generations of the elders, they were school boarded and, you know, that trauma is, um, is passed on to the, the, the next generation. So, um, we have, we do a lot of work with our members and our community to, um, build that bridge. I always see myself as being the bridge in understanding and, um, unfortunately in some occasions it, it's, it's hard because um, the other agency is not willing to understand and, um, and work with the person and you know be more empathetic. So depending on the department, I understand uh, from a CPS point an aspect and um, but also, you know, as an advocate, continue to see the positive in people and the positive in, in the departments and programs. And we all want the same thing. We want families together and healed and um, to thrive. So I try to focus on that and uh, and I try to pass that on to my clients, like focus and, you know, but again, everybody's healing is different and it's at a slower pace. But yeah, we do, we all, uh, see it often. And we we try to work with it, and that and, you know we're very fortunate that we have a lot of collaboration departments within Oneida um, to help us uh, facilitate that. We have you know um, behavioral health, and we have the wellness department that they're finally fully staffed as well, and um, we have um, we have parenting, which they do um, you know conscience discipline and. Uh, uh, not positive um, trauma informed parenting, and they have they have added a cultural factor into their teachings too. So um, it's slightly different than you know the normal um, curriculum that counties or other departments teach. Thank you for sharing that. I think something you said really stuck with me. Where um, you can acknowledge it, but you can't focus on it in order to grow. And I think that's really important to remember, especially in this line of work where we have a ton of generational and historical trauma that we need to unpack and grow from. So that's awesome. Uh, thank you for answering. Um, 
I don't believe there are any more questions. So if there's anything else you would like to share. Um, then yeah, I wanted to show some of the show and tell if that's okay. Yeah, of course. So what a weaving basket was, I'm not sure if it, uh, you know, anybody's familiar, but this are handmade. It takes weeks and weeks and um, it, they're just gorgeous. This was gifted to me. I wish I could say I made it, but it, it, it takes a patience, a lot of patience to make one, especially this big. I have this one and I have this little one super cute. But hopefully I want to start with this when I start in our next programming uh, for our healing group. I want to start with something small like this so the community can finish it. We do it in like a four week session, two hours at a time. Um, and then we have, uh, we just finished our beating group as well. It's, um, and we, um, we were able to make earrings um with our clients that's so beautiful examples I have a and it's just people pick their colors we provide all the material all they have to do is show up um and then this was um we haven't tried a uh dream catcher and this is beaded as well and these are real feathers. So um, soon, I hope. And if anybody's available, they're more than welcome to come to my event tonight. Sarah and Emma will be presenting their book. We're going to pass out books to the first 25 people that show up. And then they can get an autograph at the end of the presentation. It's today. It says 3.30, but we were not going to start till 4, 4 to 6. And I feel that she has a sexual assault story, trauma, healing, and how she's doing today. And it's very um, empowered for it. So if anybody, you want me to send the flyer with the information, I will. Um, this is open to the community. We don't have registration or limits. You just show up and enjoy the presentation. Yeah, and that's it for me. Thank you for taking the time. I appreciate it. Um, I hope you learned something from me. Um, I feel like I didn't really explain my how long I've been here in Oneida. I just jumped right on. I was a little nervous. I was like trying to sort out my thoughts from planning to here and focus. I've been with Oneida for eight years. I've been in different departments. I was in ICW, Indian Child Welfare. It was that's kind of where I started thinking I can be an advocate because that's all you do as an ICW worker. <laughs> and um, it's heavy work, burned out. And this is I transition. I feel like it was a great move for me. I'm passionate. I hope I can do it for a long time. And um, yeah, if you ever want to find um, more information on our program. I think somebody posted our website or if you have questions or ever want to shadow me or get a tour of our building or hopefully we're trying to add two more positions. One is for human trafficking advocate. We feel like we have a huge need for that. And um, the other one is an administrator grant management it's like an entry level um and you don't when it's grant funded positions you don't have to be native um to apply um as long as you have the education and uh, experience um you can apply and um hopefully encourage some people it's a great organization to work for yeah, your passion is inspiring. So I hope anyone listening um, is really open to coming to events, um, applying if you can, and all those things. Thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you for having our uh, helping us make this Ask an Advocate series of 2023 so successful. You're amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me.